All right. Hello, everybody. Hopefully everybody can see me. <laughs> Looks like I'm spotlit. Wow, we've got a lot of people joining us. A lot of classrooms joining us right now. Good morning, friends. I know you all are probably expecting to see some giant redwood trees behind me, uh, but we're, uh, I'm joining you this morning from the desert and I promise we're going to uh, uh, travel to the redwoods in just a little bit, um, but I'm gonna make sure, man, we have so many of you coming here today. This is amazing. Happy Earth Week, everybody. Everybody do a little dance, Earth Week, woo! <laughs> All right, the friends. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Lydia. I'm here at a park in Southern California called Anza Borrego Desert State Park. And I am here really quickly to introduce uh, a very special uh, state park friend of ours, actually the director of state parks, Armando Contero. Good morning, Armando. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing great. I hope everybody out there is doing well, too. So good to see you all. And um, so Armando, can you tell us a little bit about how you're celebrating Earth Week and maybe why uh, do you think it's so important for our friends on this call to be celebrating Earth Week? You know, I actually celebrate Earth, Earth Week all the time. I go to parks every week, every, every week. I'm somewhere in parks on my own time or with my work time. And I always set aside time to get out there by myself and just soak in the places, whether it's a historic site or a natural area. And, um, and just recently, I was up at the North Coast Redwoods at Humboldt um, and uh, the Redwood State Park up on the North Coast. Got to visit with the Yurok tribal leaders there and walked out into the Redwoods, went to the lagoons and the coast with those individuals and got a cultural view of that part of the world with them. Um, this week, I was down, just yesterday, I was down at Point Lobos, which is an extraordinary park on the coast where there's Monterey Pines and Monterey Cypress. Um, there's actually a canyon beneath the sea, right as Los Lobos, that's twice the size of the Grand Canyon, but you can't see it. But it's right there and hits a place called Monastery Beach. So if you go to Point Lobos, there is a Grand Canyon beneath your feet as you look out to the west. And I also went out into Point Lobos to look at places like China Cove that's got harbor seals in it and the water is turquoise and it looks like you're in a tropical island. So I get out to parks all the time. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to be exploring San Francisco Bay with the Coast Guard um, as we nice. look at some of the things that we do together. So, and then one last thing this afternoon when I get home from work, I'm setting up a new beehive in my backyard. I keep bees and I have a, my garden is mostly native plants and I have a vegetable garden and fruit trees. And one of the things that I do is keep bees because they make the planet healthier. And so that's a specific contribution I'm making to Earth Week. Earth Week. That is awesome. And, you know, I think it's, it's so important, you know, to go out and visit these parks and have these real world experiences where you're witnessing, you know, these tallest trees or seeing the beautiful ocean uh, uh, alongside the trees in, in Point Lobos. They're really magical, magical experiences. And so I encourage all of our uh, friends uh, that are joining us today Hopefully that helped. Uh, all of our friends uh, that are joining us today uh, to um, uh, take a look at parks near you. Try and find out which state park is closest to you uh, and try and go to visit it. Because you know what? We have a couple of really cool ways that you can visit your local state parks. Uh, in fact, this week we are highlighting uh, uh, parks that are participating in our Adventure Pass program. Armando, could you tell us a little bit about what is this Adventure Pass program? The Adventure Pass program is for fourth graders and you can go online, you can see the information on the screen where you can go online and sign up. You'll be sent a, a, a pass that allows you to take your family to any of 19 state parks that are participating where we have hired a, a team of interpreters um, who will bring your family in and take you on a family adventure at those 19 parks. Those 19 parks are listed on the website when you go on, on there and the pass is free. And right now, I think over 
13,000 students have already registered for their fourth grade adventure class. Wow, that's a, that's uh, pretty impressive. Uh, and you know, if you are not a fourth grader and you're joining us, uh, no fear, we have other options as well. In fact, if you take a trip down to your local library, uh, we have something called a library pass. Armando, can you tell us about the uh, library pass? So if you go to your local library and they have one of these available for you, if it's not checked out, this is called a hang tag and it goes on your rear view mirror. And what this does is it gets you into a park for free. And if you have to pay for parking in the park, this takes care of that parking fee as well. And so this will work at any park that charges a fee for uh, either parking or an entrance fee. And again, every single library in the state has some of these that people can check out. For some libraries, you can check it out usually for a week. Um, others have a little bit more time, but this is the parks library pass. And what's great about this is that the librarians are preparing to work with folks who come into the libraries to direct them to the parks where they can use their parks library pass. Awesome. So we have a lot of different options for, for all of these students to be able to get out and explore. But if you're not quite sure where you want to explore, feel like you want to get inspired, we've got a really expiring inspiring uh, uh, program for you all today. So uh, Armando, would you like to say any uh, last, you know, final remarks before we uh, move on to the Redwoods? Let's stretch out Earth Week to Earth Year. I think every day there's little things that we can do and there's cool things that we can do to celebrate, whether it's keeping bees and actually getting your own honey from your own bees or walking out into the Redwoods or the coast or the desert and just walking into this incredible place that we get to call home. I love that. Uh, thank you so much, Armando. We love this Earth Year uh, uh, as we celebrate this week. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your, your busy schedule uh, uh, to come in and share uh, this with uh, all of our friends here with the Ports Program. So thank you so this, much. This is the most important thing I'm doing today. Happy Earth Year to all of you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. All right, so friends, I am going to introduce our next guest who's gonna take over this whole program. He's hiding out in a redwood forest right now. His name is Steve. Everybody say hello, Steve, and take it away. Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> awesome, I'm so happy to be here joining you with uh, all of you out here at uh, Hendywood State Park which is a great place. We're going to be talking all about these amazing trees today. Um, but we're gonna be taking a look at how these trees um, interact with our earth cycles. And because it is Earth Week, it's really amazing to think that the whole world is so complex and so interconnected, then we gotta take a look at how all these different living organisms, ecosystems, everything from big to small, all interact together to make our amazing planet Earth. And so we're gonna be talking about the amazing coast redwoods here at Hendywood. And uh, we're gonna be talking about how they're interconnected with our Earth cycles and how they interact with our water cycles, with our soil cycles, um, with our gas cycles. And it's a really complex world that we live in. But it's amazing if you take a deeper look and figure out just how everything works. So I'm gonna give you guys a quick look around this amazing park before I jump in and talk all about the trees. Now this is Hendywood State Park. This is actually, we've just been learning about the um, fourth grade adventure pass. This is one of those parks that you would be able to visit with the fourth grade adventure pass. One of 19 state parks that you can have a free entry for a whole year that you're a fourth grader. And we got uh, five, uh, well, we have seven miles of hiking trails um, that you can explore. Lots and lots of campsites, a beautiful river that you can uh, swim in throughout the year. And yes, this is amazing redwood grove. But the coast redwoods are very special to California because these are California's state tree. These trees have ha had so much history that they've shared with us as people. You know, even before settlement in California, the Native American people known as the Pomo tribe had lived here since time immemorial. And their relationship with the forest was very 
different than the newcomers who were about to make their way here. You know, they would take sparingly from the forest, only really taking what was needed. And well, as hundreds of thousands of newcomers made their way to California during, well, the big movement of the gold rush. These trees, the amazing coast redwoods were used as a, as a resource, as something that could be used. And in a very short period of time, these trees were cut down in mass amounts to provide enough lumber to build our very first cities. But the coast redwoods are so amazing. There's so much more than a resource. These trees provide natural services to us, support a huge ecosystem and habitat for many different types of animals. Now, I say that these trees are natural wonders of the world because if I stand next to this tree, I don't look like a very big person. Now, that's, that's really okay. <laughs> that's what fine to hear because you know what? As I stand next to this tree, I'm standing next to a living giant, a, um, a ancient being that has been here for thousands of years. Now, if I measure this tree, drawing a line straight from one side all the way through the middle of the tree, I find out that this tree is about 15 foot wide, quite large. But the coast redwoods are very significant because these are the world's tallest living species, the tallest <laughs> living organism out there. So let's just take a look, because when you come to the redwood forest, it's really hard to not get a kink in your neck because you're going to spend a lot of time just looking up. So these trees are so well adapted, so um, amazing and tower above everything else that grows in nature. And we start to look up towards the sky. We notice that, well, we see our very first branches there, already a hundred foot up the trunk of the tree. And these trees continue to tower above everything else that grows in nature, reaching heights of over 350 feet tall. These trees are truly amazing. And well, with the right set of adaptations, these trees were able to survive sometimes longer than 2000 years in age. These trees are natural wonders of the world, but they also are very interconnected with the local earth cycles, the hydrological cycle, the soil cycle, life cycles of many different types of um, organisms that you'll find in this forest. But it all is in a very specific part of California. The coast redwood forest is, as you may have guessed, on the coast. <laughs> So we see um, along the coast of California, you see the regions marked in green on this map, stretching all the way from the Crescent City to, uh, past Eureka, even farther south past uh, Mendocino, where I, I am actually in Mendocino County right now. Um, if I want to get you a little bit closer so you can see where Hendywood State Park is, well, it's one of these orange dots right in the middle. <laughs> very uh, small amount of the um, coast redwood forest remain after logging. As all these regions marked in green on this map are where we've seen the uh, coast redwoods were throughout history. But, you know, in a short amount of time, in a little bit over 200 years since the gold rush, the coast redwood forest has been cut down in large amounts, leaving the only 75,000 acres of what used to be 2 million acres. But as these trees grow in this specific part of, the, of California, along the coast, now these trees rely on lots of water, but they also participate in a great amount of the hydrological cycle, where you know we know our uh, weather patterns and our, um, our, our uh, rain, our rainfall, our rivers, our oceans are all connected through the hydrological cycle. Now this is where, <laughs> of course, you have um, our oceans and our lakes are holding on to massive quantities of water in their liquid form. Now when the pressure is right, when the barometric pressure reaches the same level as the, as the vapor pressure, of water, all of a sudden we start to see that water will start to, what, evaporate. Evaporate up into our atmosphere and um, become its gaseous form. And as it's passing through the atmosphere, 
Well, water is somewhat connected or it's attached, uh, attracted to itself. So then it starts to condense into clouds. Now, everybody knows that it would be go evaporation to condensation and then eventually precipitation when those um, when the clouds get thick and heavy, it'll start to rain. But in between that time, now here's where the redwoods might actually um, here's where the redwoods might actually interact with the with the hydrological cycle. As these trees tower above everything else, well, they are reaching into the clouds clouds and fog as it passes by the tops of these trees will actually start to condense upon those leaves enough to actually create its own rain. As these trees reach way up into the sky, well, the top of the tree captures some of that water and makes its own rain. This is called fog drip. And the redwoods are very unique in that they being the first trees to, um, to receive some of these fog, this fog and these clouds, well, they hold on to some of those water droplets within the upper canopy needles. So as the water is passing by, the water will collect on these needles and it'll start to drip down. The redwoods create their own rain this way. Now, as that water falls down, it actually ends up watering a lot of the plants below. You might see the understory plants, redwood sorrel, some ferns, some of the smaller trees, even some moss that grows on these logs are all part of this ecosystem. And they actually get their water, not from the rain, but from the redwoods and the dripping uh, drops off the, of the redwood trees themselves. So this is where the redwoods interact with our hydrological cycle. And yes, it is very much how ecosystems work. Very complex puzzles that are sometimes tough to piece together. But here's the trick. Now, as it falls down onto the ground, all that water soaks into the ground, it starts to soak into the soil and it pick, gets picked up by the root system and transported up the trunk of the tree through a process that we call transpiration. Because the entire trunk of that tree is like a giant straw. And it draws all that water up the trunk of the tree. <laughs> and once it reaches the top, what does it do? It actually is released out. Some of it used in photosynthesis, but the remaining water will be passed along into the clouds to the neighboring trees. So if the redwood trees the pass the fog, it drips down, moves up the tree, and is passed to the next tree. This is a step that is kind of unique in the redwood forest. And if you're watching from a distant location um, and see a, a, across a ridge, you might see clouds of, of uh, water vapor coming out the top of the redwoods. So this is really amazing. In fact, we think about how much water is uh, drawn from the fog from the redwoods and how much is actually drank up through the roots. 60% goes through the root system like a normal tree, but the other 40% is actually drank directly out of the sky. So <laughs> amazing. This is just one of those ways. Now, we know that plants use, well, they use water in a process known as photosynthesis. Water is really a key ingredient to life on earth if we think about all the different things that use water well lots of life do <laughs> um lots of different living organisms can use that water so we think about um well water it's h2o it falls from the sky it's just shared throughout our rivers and our and our um different um lakes and all all that but when it comes down to it you know, living organisms are built of about 70% water. You know, our bodies as uh, animals, humans, we are made of 70% water. Trees are made of 70% water. And many other living organisms, even the surface of our earth is 70% water. <laughs> now plants will use this in the process of photosynthesis and using the 
sunlight and just the gases that are in their atmosphere, well, they can produce their own sugar. And well, what are those ingredients? This is where redwood trees and all plants actually interact with our gas cycle. Now, if we all take a deep breath, right? We take a deep breath, we're breathing in all the air, but as our body uses oxygen out of that air, it'll pack it onto our blood cells and then, and then uh, get moved through our body and use throughout our whole body in cellular respiration. But as we breathe out, we exhale something called carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide is something that we have been very concerned about for, um, for the last long bit. And it is one of the leading causes to climate change. And well, the cool thing about trees and plants is that plants all use carbon dioxide to build themselves, to make their own food. And it is in the process of photosynthesis, which occur within the leaves of a plant. Sunlight comes down and these leaves are designed, well, their function is to absorb that sunlight and turn that sunlight into usable energy. But how does it use that energy? To take that water and that carbon dioxide and rearrange it to make sugar, glucose. And well, that glucose is the basis of the food chain in our whole planet. The glucose is um, how a plant makes more parts of itself. It can make more leaves using that glucose. It can make more roots, more shoots, all parts of the tree are made using glucose as the basic building block. But <laughs> what is amazing is that the carbon dioxide is being cycled back into the earth, into a solid form within the plant, being locked away where it's not really um, that big of a problem like it is in our atmosphere. And after the plant has done that photosynthesis and made its own sugar, well, guess what? There's leftover gases. There is leftover oxygen, which it releases into the atmosphere. And yes, we get a chance to <laughs> breathe as animals. Now, this all may seem like a lot, but so far we've learned that the trees have um, been able to interact with our hydrological cycle, drinking up water out of their roots, but also out of the sky. And using that water along with carbon dioxide to build themselves. And because of the redwoods being so big and so large, the redwoods are known as one of the biggest carbon sinks in the whole world. That's because from the atmosphere, they store more carbon than any other terrestrial plant on Earth. So we need to know that these trees really deserve us, uh, our protection. And uh, yes, these trees are very large, surviving for thousands of years, storing thousands of years of carbon. Well, one thing that's also very interconnected with how plants grow and how these redwoods uh, participate is the soil cycle. Now these trees do take a long time to decompose, but they create a very unique uh, soil that is really part of their uh, ecosystem. And all the plants that exist within the redwood forest um, rely on the redwoods to keep that soil just the way it is. As uh, well, we've got to talk about this root system. Roots, um, you know, part of their job as roots of the tree, part of their job is not only to drink up water and, um, and anchor the tree in the ground. Roots are also, a um, big part of the roots is to drink up nutrients along with that water. Now let's just show you how big this uh, root system is because it like, makes me look really small when I'm standing next to it. So, <laughs> huh? Right. Look at it, <laughs> I'm pretty tiny. Now the roots of a redwood are uh, quite large, stretching out about a hundred foot from the trunk of the tree. What we see here is only the tip of the iceberg. 
We only see about 20 feet sticking out of the ground. But as these trees um, may uproot from time to time, they actually will churn the whole earth. They will aerate the soil. And <laughs> along with it, they fall to the ground. And as they start to, uh, start to collect more water and more moisture, well, very, very slowly, these trees will start to replenish the soil. But they can't do it on their own. They need help from different decomposers. Things like fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates help to break down soil and break, it, uh, break down organic matter like the whole tree. Like the leaves and the <laughs> leaves and rocks and things that we find on the ground all need to be broken down into tinier little bits to add nutrients to the soil so that all the plants get what they need, those vitamins really. But it's a slow process in the redwood forest. The life of a, for, of a redwood is very long. And because, uh, <laughs> because these trees take so long to decompose, it's really important that nutrients get added throughout, um, throughout the long life of the soil itself. Now, this is where this forest actually ends up being uh, very healthy in what we call a floodplain, where this is an area that's really flat, but up in the distance, we actually would see that this forest is at the base of a very large hill, a watershed. Now, as it rains, all that water is going to soak in, start flowing downhill. But as it's flowing down, it starts to pick up nutrients and deposit in the soil below. New soil for the redwood forest, all brought by floods. And so we find that the redwoods really do well in the, in the um, flood plain. Yes, but the one thing is these, these trees, because their root system so well established in the ground, they make sure that the soil is not being eroded away. And in areas where the redwoods had been cut down and removed, well, we saw an increase of erosion. Our waterways, our streams were being polluted with lots of sediment. So this, uh, <laughs> this is very, um, very complex, but the trees in this forest are kind of the keepers of their ecosystem. They not only water the trees around them, they produce shelter for lots of the different animals you might find in this forest. And they help with the soil cycles, preventing erosion, and truly a reason why these trees should be protected. So really, when it comes down to it, parks that protect uh, you know, redwood forests and ecosystems of all types, well, they're there for a reason. These are important places. You know, these trees do so much in our fight against climate change and the um, soil cycles in preventing erosion that, you know, all part of a very complex system. And so with our theme for Earth Day this year, invest in our planet this by supporting California State Parks, going out and visiting, exploring parks like the one that I'm in today. Well, you're supporting our planet by protecting these ecosystems. And well, <laughs> these places are very unique and beautiful ecosystems all throughout California are very unique. We have some of the most diverse um, ecosystems and environments that, uh, well, on the planet, really, you go anywhere else, you're going to see some different things. But you might not ever get to see the Coast Redwoods anywhere else in the world. So with that, everybody, I want to thank you guys for your time. We have really, <laughs> we have really learned a lot today. I do encourage you to keep on celebrating Earth Week. This is a great uh, way to learn all about the different places that are so special to us in California. Um, and yes, there are more programs coming up uh, tomorrow. Am I right? <laughs> Yes, we got um, tomorrow, you, you can do a program on the secret lives under leaves at 11 o'clock.
And as well, there is a, another program at two o'clock, the effects of climate change at Citrus Park. So thank you guys so much for all being here. Enjoy our parks and uh, well, happy Earth Week, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. <laughs>